Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this third day of Bhautiki Yatra, a travel for scientific Indian minds. Today, we have a, one great speaker with us from CSIR and National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. And before that, we have one very special guest from our university, our senior syndicate member and very active and very active dynamic and academician, Dr. Dharam Kambalia, sir. For that, I would like to invite Dr. Dharam Kambalia, sir, for their welcome address. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Chitam Bhai. Namaskar. I, Dr. Dharam Kambalia, member of syndicate Saurashi University. Welcome of you on this virtual platform. Good morning, all of you present on this digital platform. Today, Saurashi University is celebration is before the established day, Sthapna Divas. This university was established on 23, 3rd May, 1967. And we remember Parambujya, first vice chancellor, Dr. Rai Makar of Saurash University. On this day, we remember all the vice chancellor and the authorities who contributed the development of the university. It is my pleasure to be a part of this that webinar, which has more than 100, 500 registration and daily 4,000 plus participants are able to attend this lecture every, every day on the platform such as Zoom, YouTube, Live and Facebook Live. We always learn from the situation and teach us much more thing recently in the time of Corona crisis with the highly appreciable initiative and the effort of the Professor Narnet Mihir Joshi, Professor Dr. Nikesh Shah, Dr. Narutam Shahu Sayati from DST, Busquet Gandhinagar, Ms. Mr. Chintan, Mr. Arsal, and all the research scholars of the Department of the Physics, Sauras University. Able to connect with you and all this platform in the such great number. I am very happy and the proud moment our university is for out of the nine speakers of this webinar are the alumni of the Department of the Physics of Rice University and today they have pro provided themselves as the established search and accept expert this own field at the national and international level. Today we have Honorable Dr. Pankaj Kodar as our today speakers who is the senior scientist at CSR National Chemical Laboratory at Pune. I welcome you, Dr. Pankaj Kodarji, and on behalf of our university of joining this talk of Bhautik Yatra. I also welcome and convey my wishes to all the speakers who have given their talk and to all the invited speakers who will share the knowledge of the expertise with you in the, these nine days. I once again thank all the organizers and Department of the Physics, Sauras University, DST, Kushkar, Gandhinagar, and Essence Tech to invite me to share my views on the webinar. I wish all the grand success of the webinar. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir, for your blessings and your motivation. Thank you, sir. Now we would like to move ahead. And for the introduction of our today's speaker, I would like to invite Ms. Himan Sudadij, a PhD scholar in the Department of Physics, Saurashtra University. Welcome. 
Good morning, one and all present here. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Pankaj Botar, who is Senior Scientist at Physical and Materials Chemistry Division at CSIR National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. Dr. Podar has completed his MSc in 1995 from University of Rajasthan in Physics with specialization in plasma physics. He has obtained his PhD degree from School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He also has obtained two postdoctoral degrees, first from November 2000 to September 2002 with Professor Gir Markovich, Department of Chemical Sciences, School of Chemistry, Tel Aviv University, Israel, and then from October 2002 to March 2005 with Professor Srikant Hariharan, Materials Laboratory, Tampa, West Virginia. Since April 4, 2005, he is working as a scientist at CSIR NCL Pune. His interest is, his current work is going on in interdisciplinary science based on nanomaterials. He teaches a three credit course at NCL on advanced instrumentation techniques like scanning probe microscopy, electron microscopy, and Raman spectroscope. Dr. Podar has received lots of awards, few of which are, he is an awarded fellow of Electron Microscope Society of India. EMSI 2017 MRSI medal for the year 2014 by Materials Society of Sciences in Physical Science Year 2013. He's also, he also received Scientist of the Year Award 2010 at NCL by NCL Research Foundation, R.A. Marshalkar Endowment Fund. He is also a recipient of Young Scientist Award in Physical Sciences 2008 by CSIR India. He is a highlighted member of high quality authors of high quality research in ACS journals in India 2012. He was also a discussion leader of a session on spin polarized materials at 2010 Gordon Conference of Magnetic Nanostructures held at Maine, USA. He has published 125 publications in refereed international journals and has got two granted patents. He has also filed two more patents. He has published three book chapters and has uh, given 11 students who have completed their PhD successfully under him and five are currently working with him. One postdoctoral fellow is also working with him at present. He has also delivered more than 120 invited plenary talks and keynote lectures. He has reviewed more than 40 international journals across various science and engineering disciplines. He was a secretary of Electron Microscopy Society of India, West Zone, from 2013 to 2015. He is also a member of Ad Hoc Board of Studies in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, University of Mumbai. He is an honorary member of American Chemical Society and an executive council member of Electron Microscope Society of India since August 2015. It's a great pleasure, sir, to have you here with us to give your talk. Today, he is going to talk about what makes transition metal chalcogenides so different from their oxide counterpart. We welcome you all, sir, and please, thank you. May I start? Uh, yes, sir. Welcome, sir, for your address. Yeah, I would like to thank the organizers uh, from Saurashtra University Department of Physics for their uh, invitation to address all of you today, this morning. And uh, the contribution is also acknowledged from Gujarat Council of Science and Technology, which goes uh, to, towards organizing this uh, series of lectures. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what makes transition metal chalcogenides so different from their oxide counterparts. And there is a lot of interest in the material science, physics, chemistry, and even engineering in both these classes of materials, chalcogenides, even halides and oxides. 
So obvious questions happen when we look at the physics of these materials that there is a distinction between metal chalcogenides and oxides and uh, distinction leads to a variety of applications, the change in the properties. So I will discuss uh, probably 50% of, of my talk on this topic later half because I see many students uh, community in today's lecture. So I will, uh, initially I will speak uh, on some of the, some of the uh, things which students may be interested in. Okay, so let us start the journey today. Uh, so I'm from uh, CSR National Chemical Laboratory, which is situated in Pune, uh, Maharashtra. And uh, this is, uh, these are the people who have contributed over the years. I like to show this as a first slide because without their contribution, uh, this kind of work won't be possible. Uh, you can see on the top, multiferroic oxides, the people who work over the years, many of them are settled abroad or in India as faculty member, postdocs. So Tuhin is, has recently joined in uh, Iser uh, Travendram uh, and uh, she, Viti Gupta on your uh, left side and uh, Jaiswal, Raja Das. And this team consists of biophysics actually. So we had a lot of investigations on biological materials uh, such as uh, bacterial cells, yeast cells, and looking at their physics actually and how they respond under the atomic force microscope tape and electron microscopy and Raman spectroscopy when they are in the stress condition, how the stress uh, response uh, leads to the nanomechanical properties changes. Uh, that was a uh, investigation and that led to many interesting uh, papers, a lot of interesting applications. Uh, next group belongs to the phosphors actually, which, which is a very leading material these days. And since last three, two, three decades, you have seen a number of applications coming. We can't live without uh, the phosphors. So Monica Malik and Preeti Pate and Dr. Geeta Sharma, she's a scientist. Uh, they have contributed immensely and uh, their contribution is really mind, mind boggling. Uh, they have contributed uh, towards finding their, the applications of nanophosphors in variety of applications, uh, starting from forensic applications, as well as uh, cancer uh, drug therapies actually, delivering the cancer drug, as well as imaging, multimodal imaging, et cetera. And towards your left side, you can see uh, a, a small uh, community uh, where only uh, you know, a couple of people are there. Some photographs are missing here. Rare earth free hard magnet. It's a, the magnets are all around you, uh, hard magnets. And most of these magnets are imported, by, imported from China. China is the lead, lead exporter of uh, rare earth hard magnets world over and it controls the supply. So it is a strategic need for our country to break free of these imports actually. So rare earth is a very big industries. I'm going, I'm basically giving more stress this morning for the benefit of young students. What are the areas they should be focusing next? So India is actually uh, slightly lagging in the, in the rare earth research, not only just uh, finding um, you know, use of, uh, uh, you know, rare earth which are mined in India, also finding some alternative uh, for making magnets or other applications uh, rare earth free or partially rare earth free. Uh, that is a really a big technological challenge actually. Uh, then you come to the metal nanoparticles that research was started by Ramya Jagannathan in my group. And it has also led to a lot of uh, interesting uh, research uh, Puneet is in US, he's doing postdoc, and Dheeraj, you can see, uh, he is a faculty member in uh, Ahmedabad, uh, IIT RAM. He is in physics department there. Uh, he was a postdoc in my group. And semiconductors are also very big uh, areas which has contributed over so many decades uh, to various devices. So this uh, slide basically tells you in physics, what are the most important uh, areas which have remained uh, for applications, basically semiconductors, magnetic materials, phosphors, metals, and these are these are leading the applications as we today uh, see today. And some of the keywords I would like to highlight, uh, which where we have focused uh, in over a, over the period of uh, several years, and magnetism, basically malaria detection, rare earth free hard magnets, as I mentioned, giant magnetocaloric effect magnetic magnetization, drugs for hypophosphatemia. This is a very inter interesting applications. 
where you can use iron oxyhydroxide coated with sugar and uh, for a uh, lot of uh, medical applications for example as i mentioned for uh, phosphatemia hyperphosphatemia rather and and also for iron deficiency so these are usually intravenous injection and during this covid period all of you know that indian drugs are really uh, coming onto the spotlight uh, world is looking towards uh, generic drugs from india so our group actually has contributed more than one decade i will come to the next slide uh, being a, being a, even a physics or chemistry laboratory uh, we have contributed a lot to the indian drug development uh, next next thing is basically ferroelec ferro materials ferroelectric materials and piezoelectric materials so there we have done a lot of work on uh, using atomic force microscope to look at the piezoelectric domains imaging of that and how you, you can uh, look at the uh, physical behavior as a function of uh, applied voltage so in metals basically i we have looked at uh, the drug conjugation primarily and uh, we also uh, were lucky to find uh, quantum clusters which is basically uh, a link between uh, atoms and nano so these clusters are basically they consist of few uh, tens of atoms uh, and believe me the chemistry of uh, quantum clusters and stabilization is not easy uh, it took us several years to reach to that kind of perfection in our laboratory in phosphors we have worked upon up conversion down conversion anti counterfeit uh, uh, things which we are working at present um okay so i'll i'll go to uh, i'll recognize my industrial partners so we have as i mentioned we have primarily we have worked with so many industries uh, mcure lupin reliance central asian pain nalco i mean i mean directly indirectly we have been glenmark these days a lot cancer rasayu cancer clinic which is ayurvedic company uh, tata steel and tcs we are we are basically uh, we have some collaborative work on covid uh, these days and do chemicals also so content of today's talk is uh, why study magnetism so many times uh, people ask that uh, physicists are over obsessed with magnetism so what is so important that so many people are working in magnetism and next next topics i'm i'm going to discuss what makes transition metal chalcogenide so different uh, from their oxide which is the topic of today's talk main topic and then i will to introduce uh, to students what do we mean by hard and semi hard magnets then i will uh, discuss uh, briefly some research in our area but this is highly specialized so it may not be suitable uh, for young students to show a lot of data so i'll keep the interest alive i will tell them a story okay let's let's everybody likes story right so let us look at the first part why study magnetism why magnetism is still important magnetism is basically first part is business magnetism is one of the largest industry uh, if you see all around you in uh, in your mobile phone computers all around you in your cars and wind turbine uh, your uh, you know your, uh, your your this wiper plate in your uh, wiper machine anywhere where you find motor or something you find magnets there not only just uh, so we will look at the ancient journey and we'll come to the modern uh, modern view of magnetism uh, quickly so what is the biggest magnet on earth it's the earth itself so there is basically a molten core of iron uh, where uh, when the earth spins uh, around this axis so this uh, molten iron also spins and that leads to uh, a current uh, in the in that basically it's there is a current and which generates the magnetic field and because of magnetic field you see a lot of uh, uh, you know the life sustains uh, because of this magnetic field on earth and today i think yesterday it was in the news that this magnetic north pole and south pole they are weakening actually and there is a prediction that in coming centuries this north pole and magnetic uh, north pole and south pole magnetic north pole and south pole which are very different than the ge geographical north pole and south pole they may flip over actually okay it now it sounds scary but it is not going to happen in our lifetime so what is the transitional p transitional state this magnetic uh, axis is uh, magnetic field is weakening actually and that is ca causing a lot of trouble for the satellites and everything you can see that this magnetic shield protects us for from lot of harmful radiation and why do we have this magnetic uh, uh, magnetic core uh, on earth not on uh, mars or some other planets the reason lies basically we still have some radioactive uh, uh, you know uh, uh, radioactive material in a, in the core of the earth 
and a lot of radioactive uh, radiation keeps uh, uh, the core of the earth still hot actually because of it is hot so your uh, the iron is uh, in the molten form and then we have this magnetic field uh, so so that's the reason that we, there is a life you can see the picture uh, this is not uh, trivial i mean it's very important how the life is there on earth there are a lot of factors one of the important factor is the magnetic field otherwise we want it we want be there so mystery how the how earlier philosophers started looking at uh, looking at the magnetism uh, i mean it's very interesting actually and most most of the time we forget to look uh, towards uh, history and how we came to the modern concept of the magnetic field field lines and uh, magnetite and all these fancy materials it was a, it was a journey of thousands of years so now the development which is happening in 10 years or 12 20 years it took 1000 year or 2000 year to reach to that kind of development actually that kind of understanding otherwise it just remain a mystery i tell you a, a story because a lot of students are there so it, there is a story that uh, from the greek civilization uh, all our stories actually come from unfortunately from greek civilization there are hardly any story uh, to tell uh, because of the way history is written from the indian civilization because the history is written by uh, the western people so most of i am sharing the their part of the story i'll come to our our part of the story also much later uh, hold on for uh, till then uh, so around 3000 years back a shepherd you know shepherd they uh, graze their sheep uh, on several hills uh, there are grazing grounds so uh, as usual the uh, shepherd uh, you know back then uh, went uh, with his sheep next morning after a very bad thunderstorm as usual and people used to there was no plastic at that time polymer you know now you have this all these shoes fancy shoes of plastic polymer they used to wear all these leather as well as uh, leather shoes with uh, sometime a uh, uh, iron plate in the sole so then his he was scared actually because his boots started sticking and he was not able to walk properly and then he was wondering that oh my god some mysterious force is there and some god has really uh, you know is pulling me towards the hill there is something mysterious in the in the hill itself and then he reported uh, back the story to some of the philosophers and one of the uh, one of the prominent philosopher of the of that that time who lived in the same town the town of uh, of of uh, mount ida uh, actually now it is in turkey uh, earlier it was greek civil part of the greek civilization and then the famous philosopher was uh, miletus actually uh, thales of miletus actually and he was contemporary to the uh, pythagoras pythagoras all of you know but you may not know uh, uh, thales actually thales is credited to laid the foundation of not just of the modern philosophy where what we see but also some crude definitions of physics and mathematics that's why we need to really uh, spend some time here and uh, when it when we look at his philosophical uh, contribution i like the three of his quotes actually that one of his the most difficult thing in the life is to know yourself the second quote which i like is nothing is more active than thought for it travels over the universe and nothing is stronger than the necessity for all of us submit to it the third one uh, third quote uh, the past is certain and the future is obscure uh, nothing of uh, none of his right original writings survive but what we know is from other philosophers they recorded his uh, his contributions and one of the philosophers was obviously pythagoras which it was his contemporary what uh, uh, thales of miletus thought that there is something action at a distance so there is some some action is taking place this so that was a discovery of lodestone what we call actually a uh, magnetite uh, iron oxide fe3o4 uh, so that was a that was one of the discovery but still people were wondering philosophers were wondering why two pieces of these magnetite lodestone they attract towards each other what is the action uh, between them uh, now we know the magnetic field line but they used to think that the iron uh, basically travels uh, from one lodestone to another lodestone and something like that and many people started uh, relating that to love and hate love is attraction and hate is repulsion because magnetic field had these properties and which was visible to the humans so humans were so much puzzled puzzled by magnetic field because it was so much visible to them and later on the atomistic view of the matter also started shaking uh, taking shape here also also in india there was a lot of uh, a lot of contribution uh, was done by indian civilization on on atomistic view uh, if you look at the literature uh, 
so basically people started thinking that uh, matter is divisible you can uh, keep on dividing uh, it uh, the matter until you reach to some uh, foundation uh, some uh, basically a, a unit uh, which which we can you cannot divide further um so this was this was the thought process and then people obviously we love to uh, take everything to applications and then the application started people started using uh, for example when we were homonoid and then we uh, we started working on our two feet then we started making tools of stone and all iron and copper and all so and so forth now we make tools of silicon right uh, so so then chinese people are thought to have uh, realized that uh, magnetic needle uh, can be used to for navigation so they used it uh, in the town planning and there are some records available that they they started using for uh, navigation in the sea and and europeans started looking at these chinese and they used to laugh that oh wow what i mean this looks uh, very uh, uh, very funny and that looks very mysterious it's 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 not they didn't believe actually uh, these applications now i'll come to the indian part which is which is which has survived actually some knowledge most of the knowledge disappeared but there is a, a word in uh, sanskrit chumbak all of you know which is very old uh, word uh, by the way so that means there is there was lot of uh, application in Ind indian temple for, for for the magnets and one of the uh, primary examples which you see is basically sun temple of konark and uh, this sun i have visited many times uh, when i visit to bhubaneswar for different uh, scientific meetings and uh, what surprises me that how much science was there actually so much of science so much of science i go as a scientist uh, there obviously many people go for cultural reason many people go for religious reasons but uh, combining all these things you can see the sun dial lot of lot of innovation happened in this temple actually so this is basically the dome main dome uh, uh, what we call it gopuram in in sanskrit of the temple which cannot be in english so uh, this is missing actually this uh, what survived is basically this structure this was a main temple structure and there was a magnetic uh, there was basically iron uh, idol in the center and at the canopy there was a piece of lodestone uh, and probably in the floor also now it is all filled with sand actually uh, just to protect the remaining uh, remaining structure otherwise it will fall down uh so then uh so this this dome is missing actually uh, it, uh, there is a story in in uh, in wikipedia that jahangir actually uh, one of the jahangir journal uh, basically uh, found this uh, idol and he ordered to break this canopy so that uh, because uh, because this idol could not be uh, dislodged because it was so that was a first uh, probably first application of magnetic levitation now we are talking about magnetic levitation now we are talking about uh, the superconducting uh, you know maglev trains the bullet train is basically which might be running in uh, 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 gujarat soon uh, this is basically uh, a example of superconducting uh, you know magnets so this is also wonderful example which i found i thought i will share with you of magnetic levitation and same thing uh, uh, in uh, basically uh, in your own area uh, uh, basic uh, your own area saurashtra uh, famous example is somnath in somnath also this uh, this idol of somnath was uh, was probably made of iron and similarly it, it was suspended in air from a lodestone which was at the uh, at the at the uh, roof of the temple or whatever canopy and so 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 many beautiful applications were there apart from architecture so now i come to the modern view actually so uh, so memories of magnetism and magnetic uh, uh, memory magnetism of memories so we use these days all kinds of memories silicon memories and uh, you know you have barium sodium titanate and you have uh, you have magnetic memories so memories are basically you have the non volatile and volatile memory sometimes you plug out the power and the memory evaporates that you call volatile memory and uh, is still there are a lot of memories which which were lot of different kinds of uh, memories basically for example magnetic hard disk you have this flash memories they are they are basically non volatile so even if you plug out the power so uh, the the information survives for information storage so the uh, the volatile memories primarily dynamic random access memory they are super fast that's why they are used reading writing is very very fast actually so these are made those memories are primarily made with the capacitors tiny capacitors are there in your uh, in your uh, chip so they keep on charging discharging for example i am doing this presentation 
uh, using dynamic random access memory okay so which because reading and writing is fast in comparison to flash memory these days flash memories are also very fast so also there is a fixed hard disk so magnetism has contributed a lot to uh, memories actually still the most reliable memory is uh, is a magnet so a lot of work we have done uh, in our group also in the past on new generation of uh, uh, memories that led us also to this uh, uh, this this topic which i will be discussing uh, 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 oxides and uh, chalcogenides uh, because that is the application part uh, because students want to know application actually so i thought i will start with uh, first layer or second layer of my talk with lot of application to excite all of you what you can do so uh, so this uh, this is magnetic hard disk spins at very very high speed actually and uh, long back i worked on the read hat of uh, these kind of uh, uh, basically uh, magnetic memories and believe me this read hat read hat is quite sophisticated in its technology it's how do you read actually so it is based on the magneto uh, magneto resistive uh, effect actually so you have uh, when you apply when you are when there is a magnetic field from the magnetic bit so there is a uh, there is basically so spin dependent scatter electron scattering get affected when you uh, apply magnetic field or you, you remove the magnetic field so this read head is uh, like you know uh, you know big boeing 747 flying just 1.5 mm uh, above uh, runway just imagine that kind of a uh, control uh, over uh, the read head so it is not a joke actually okay so uh, next memory which is nowadays uh, it, even in my uh, computer i am using the flash memory these are basically silicon based so how do we know that the bit is magnetic bit is written so there are tools uh, modern tools are one of them is magnetic force microscopy so you have a magnetic tip and you can move the magnetic tip of atomic force microscope over the magnetic media or any magnetic materials and uh depending upon the type of uh, interaction whether it is attractive interaction so then this atomic force microscope tip get uh, pulled over the surface then we know the deflection in the cantilever and that is recorded as a attractive field and any repulsion where the cantilever get pushed away is recorded as as a, as a repulsive as a other domain actually so we can do the domain imaging very easily using magnetic force microscopy there are other techniques as well for example uh, magneto carry fact uh, okay so which the resolution may be little bit uh, but there are very there are excellent techniques other imaging techniques are also excellent they fill in the blanks where uh, these magnetic uh, magnetic uh, magnetic force microscopy of all short another technique very high resolution techniques basically lorange force microscopy which and this is one of the snapshot from our laboratory we have this uh, uh, physical property measurement uh, setup you might be wondering students that how do we measure all these oxides chalcogenides for all these fascinating physical properties so this is one tool which can measure thermal properties uh, electrical properties magnetic properties and even we can couple it with the impedance properties so there is a liquid helium there nine tesla superconducting magnet and this tool can go from 2 kelvin to uh, probably uh, you know 400 kelvin and much beyond uh, depending upon the attachments uh, we put in and this is our microscopy laboratory now i will cover some basics for the students uh, most of you are physics students and uh, many of you are from chemistry background also but the science remains the same actually all of you we know the ferromagnets right uh, ferry uh, lodestone magnetite is a ferry magnet okay so when we start breaking down this uh, ferromagnet into smaller and smaller pieces all of you know that these ferromagnets have got domains magnetic domains spin up and another domain is spin down so this is spin up domain this is spin down domain there is a domain wall in between Uh, so this is another domain wall this is a spin up domain spin down domain there is a domain wall so now when you uh, keep on breaking down the particle size when the particle size is less than this single single domain if you see this single domain domain that means in that particle size particle in in a single particle all the spins should be oriented in one direction okay like what you see it here so this uh, one particle can be considered as a giant uh, single magnetic dipole and the, so this is this is no longer uh, considered as a 
as a, as a typical ferromagnet, but we call it as a super paramagnet. And uh, the reason being that it behaves like a paramagnet where spin fluctuates because of the thermal activation energy. So there is a, there is a, uh, there is a lot of uh, competition between magnetic anisotropy energy, uh, KV, V is the volume of the particle, right? Uh, we know the we know the radius, then we can calculate the volume. Uh, and K is the magnetic crystalline anisotropy. If we have these two numbers, we know the magnetic anisotropy energy. Why this is one of the why it is important. It's it's one of the most important. Uh, you know, believe me, I'm putting these these things because it's one of the most important. Uh, it's a billion billion dollar research to increase K and decrease V. You do not realize, but when you go to the market and buy a new computer, you are looking for one terabyte, two terabyte hard disk increasingly. I, in my thesis, my hard disk what was probably, uh, you know, 800 megabyte. Uh, okay, don't, uh, I think your jaws will drop by this number, 800 megabyte and entire my PhD was done. Okay, is it possible now? No, it's not possible. So how do you cram more and more uh, information into the same area? How do you miniaturize all that? But you have only two ways. You have to increase the anisotropy energy because KBT, you know, you see, you see this thermal activation energy. Uh, so it is acting against, uh, uh, you know, so you don't want uh, information to be lost after some time, okay? Uh, for example, you have written uh, something on the hard disk, you save, you went to sleep and uh, you forgot for two months, three months, one year, and then you turned on your uh, hard disk and then you want to fi find all your file intact, you will be mad if your hard disk crashes, okay? So uh, hard disk crash, essentially, one of the reason is basically your read had crashing into your hard disk, actually. So you can see that, the, so one of the, uh, there are two things scientists are trying to increase, uh, finding new materials for uh, increasing K. So we were looking at uh, some materials where we can increase K. So we stumbled upon, uh, we were looking at oxides, transition metal oxides, and then we started looking at chalcogenides, and then we found this interesting material, uh, Fe3SE4, iron, uh, iron selenide, Fe3SE4, which we found that K is quite large, actually, K quite, quite large, but saturation mineralization was a bit low, but then it was very interesting, actually, so because it's very cheap, and then we were wondering that why, uh, what is the reason that uh, uh, iron oxide Fe3O4, which is a very, you know, which is 3000 year old material, why it is so, why that, what are the similarities uh, and dissimilarities between Fe3O4 and Fe3SC4? So this is going, this is the focus of the next lecture, but the origin of all these uh, science, the thought process I'm sharing with you what is what led to us to this excitement. Okay, there has to be some excitement in the scientists actually that okay, I want to do this research. So excitement was to decrease the volume actually so that we can uh, put more and more uh, information on a limited area. And also another uh, reason was to increase K so that we can we can compete with this thermal activation energy and prevent this uh, spins to flip over. Uh, okay. One of the application was this. I'll come to the other application. There are many potential applications because we are still uh, working on this material, modifying, remodifying, and uh, uh, which not a, it's a big journey. It's long journey. Um, so, and in this process, we learned a lot of interesting things. Uh, in this, okay, how to, how can we improve this? And application wise, uh, we realized that uh, this can be also potential material for rare earth uh, free hard mag magnet. Remember that I told you the China story that we are in importing all those things from China. So, uh, so we, were, we were also one of another motivation was can, can we uh, find some alternative, uh, cheaper alternative may not be that good uh, for this uh, 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 basically rare earth hard magnets. And uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, if you peek inside the uh, lattice, this is simulation, uh, you find uh, that these nano magnetic materials the surface spins behave very differently than the core spins actually. So they can be uh, cantered, they can be disordered. Uh, so that also poses uh, unique challenges. So these are, this is basically, this tells you uh, uh, some of the uh, famous materials, iron, nickel, cobalt, uh, gamma, Fe2O3, Fe3O4, which is uh, magnetite, 
iron platinum is and cobalt platinum is they are very very well researched materials for hard disk industries cobalt ferrite is again a hard material magnetically hard material very famous material of course barium strontium ferrite there are other candidates uh, as well so what do you do you go to the chemistry lab and we uh, that's why we our group loves chemistry uh, we are we work in the national chemical laboratory so we we have excellent uh, stream of uh, very bright uh, talented chemistry students and we can uh, make highly ordered uh, magnetic nanoparticles this is the image uh, from my own past uh, basically you can see a nice beautiful array of uh, magnetite nanoparticles these are tiny uh, around 10 12 nanometer very uniform in size and you can see that they it's called basically solvent uh, i mean there was nothing used to uh, uh, let them assemble they they assemble themselves uh, okay if you zoom this then you find that uh, there are there is a beautiful uh, assembly of these particles each particle is basically iron oxide and i told you right that these particles can be uh, you know they are not can be i mean they are some of um, not uh, iron oxide but other materials are being used uh, for informal story you can see nice facets here if you zoom further you can see lattice fringes okay these are by the way people who are uh, at an un undergraduate level these are transmission electron microscope images what we call phase contrast microscopy right hrtm and this is the scale uh, for the young student undergraduate student this scale is 2 nanometer you can see the entire size you can measure so this is 2 nanometer so this is going to be around uh, 10 nanometer so science at this scale becomes increasingly uh, challenging for to understand and for, for example if you want to uh, look at the magnetism from single particle magnetism how single particle magnetism uh, can look like because uh, just uh, believe me that uh, our lot of interest uh, is is there how these magnets talk to each other remember your school experiment where you could throw some bar magnets on table and you could play with them and you could make chain and you could uh, pile them in a different way the fridge magnets right you put on the fridge same way they 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 can behave very uh, very nicely actually i mean you, you know the magnetic putty the kids play with the magnetic putty they they make uh, all kinds of things so magnetism is actually fun magnetism is also fun and that is proven by nature so many species many life forms they use uh, basically uh, magnetic gps not only humans discovered uh, so millions of probably millions and millions of years back uh, this life form uh, because there was so much of uh, iron they uh, learned to navigate uh, in the earth's magnetic field which is very feeble field very weak field but you can i mean just just think about that i mean when i when i think actually when i was coming uh, to my office to give this lecture and i was looking at uh, bees actually there are a lot of bees uh, at, in my home they uh, no bees the, you know the thirsty bee the, when there was a lot of some water on the walkway in my house and bees came to sip uh, water in heat and i was i was looking at at the bees that how this tiny bee from far away knew the presence of water and how will they uh, take this water and go back to their uh, their bee hive uh, or their home and they will uh, take this water how will they find home uh, can can i leave one of you uh, in the forest and far away go in search of water without a mobile phone without gps can you come back uh, uh, to home if i put a, a blindfold uh, if, if i let you close your eyes you can't do that you will cry actually okay you will call your mom and dad okay save me okay and uh, but uh, bees you know they can find their food the flowers they collect the nectar and they reach to the uh, uh, their home same with bacteria bacteria also they use a lot of bacteria bacterial species they use the magnetic gps birds birds also they use so i mean fine they can you can use the you can i mean the bees can use tiny magnets okay fine no problem birds can also use but earth's magnetic field is so weak that means they you know in laboratory we use this gauss meters so that means they can sense how can they sense actually that was mind blowing actually i mean i was i when i think about that my mind start you know i go into that thought process how can they sense such a weak field actually okay so that's that's very uh, unique actually something unique 
uh, evolution has done to them. It's basically power of uh, evolution, uh, which we see. And uh, this, this information is just trickling in, you know, believe me, every year we find new, new information about life form, how important they are on the magnetic field. So, you know, this mobile phone signals and other random electromagnetic noise, it is confusing them. So I was thinking, uh, I never thought, I never found uh, such a large population of butterflies and bees uh, in my garden at NCL colony, which I find today because a lot of noise pollution and all those things are is reduced. So uh, microbes, you know, uh, we are 10% human, we are 90% uh, uh, microbes, you will be surprised to know, but 90% of your cells are not human cells, they are all microbial cells, okay, so when you call you Mr. So-and-so, when I call myself Pankaj Bodhar, so I am 10% Pankaj Bodhar, 90% I am actually microbes, so you can, you can say that 90% of the microbes are giving this talk today to you, okay, isn't it wonderful, you are talking to microbes actually, now you are listening to microbes actually. Okay, coming back to the uh, microbes. So this was one of the interesting uh, signs that uh, people found magnetotactic bacterium. And when they, when they dis what they discovered, uh, so this was a very successful collaboration between a physicist Frankel, uh, Richard Frankel at Francis Bitter National Magnetic, uh, Magnet Laboratory at MIT and Blackmore who was the professor in microbiology. So Black Blackmore was looking at a sample from lake water and he was put, he, put, he was putting those samples under the microscope. What he discovered was what he discovered was tiny magnets, tiny tiny microbes. And whatever he did, those microbes were turning into certain uh, direction. And he was not sure why this all these microbes are moving in certain direction. Actually, then he could relate that. Oh wow, this is something to do with the Earth's magnetic field, north, south, uh, east, west. Then he re, uh, uh, he rushed basically to uh, uh, Professor Frankel and then together they did transmission electromicroscopy and a lot of other like Mosberg spectroscopy and other other uh, physics experiment. And then they discovered that it is because of the natural uh, deposition of uh, uh, iron oxide, sometimes iron uh, sulfide also. So you can see all, I'm giving you flavor of my title uh, talk. You can see that chal chalcogenite, dragonite, is is also there sometimes when there is, there is water is sulfur rich and also iron oxide, any of these things. Nature doesn't, uh, 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 you know, whatever is useful, it, it tries to use. Uh, so also scientists are trying to find whether uh, presence of these microbes on Mars is basically a signature uh, of life on Mars. So, so basically they looked at uh, a lot of these magnetophosils uh, almost 1.9 billion uh, year old. And they were looking at a uh, meteoroid sample from Mars and whether they can find these magnetophosils, what they, what they call, uh, okay. So GPS of honey bees decoded, honey bees basically, uh, as I told you, so scientists basically what they did, they took different parts of the bee uh, head and uh, abdomen and other areas. So they found that this magnetic magnets were basically concentrated, concentrated in the abdomen actually, not in the head. For birds, uh, birds basically pro probably these magnetic uh, magnetic particles are concentrated in, in their in their uh, bees. So, so same experiment. A lot of experiments were done. You know, uh, for the migratory birds, they can travel. You know, uh, thousands and thousands of miles. I mean, can we do that? No, not at all. Humans cannot do that. You know, uh, you know just just imagine that. Uh, uh, it's it's a problem. Uh, migration is a big problem. Uh, without having any knowledge, without having conscious brain, such a, a large developed brain. So in evolution, humans uh, develop uh, uh, neocortex, a better brain, but we lost a lot of uh, survival skills actually. So in, when it comes to survival, these bees and butterflies and uh, the birds and bugs, they are much better than us actually. Okay. The, uh, and science actually proves uh, this thing. Uh, so what about humans? Uh, do we have uh, 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 this kind of a sensor? And uh, yes and no, I mean, there, is, there are some uh, recent research are trickling in that probably we have it, but we lost it, the power to detect, we, uh, we lost actually somewhere. So uh, uh, lot of, a lot of, lot of research was done and one of the famous researcher Researcher was Robin Baker, and but he he was hounded uh, so madly uh, 
uh, by the research community that oh this is all pseudoscience and he had to shut down that research now he's doing something else but what he used to do he used to in the middle of the night he used to take 15 20 uh, people blindfolded and he used to uh, leave them in the forest uh, and ask them to come back home uh, on their own so <laughs> he found actually uh, he did publish a lot of papers but recently there is a paper in nature communication which uh, which probably which says that probably down the line in, in evolution we had uh, some kind of light dependent magnetic sensitivity we had some uh, particular protein which could do this job so this is this is what is the uh, uh, you know also uh, dog poop in alignment with earth's magnetic field you know see see even dogs are smarter than human so when they go and poop in the poop they don't just poop like uh, you know anywhere uh, they they align themselves with the earth's magnetic field okay Uh, we don't do that okay <laughs> so so you can see how why how this uh, question is answered that uh, why uh, physicists and biologists and chemists they have so they have so much of interest in the in the uh, in the magnetism actually future of energy is another topic which uh, which basically uh, is uh, uh, connected to today's thing which i am going to introduce so uh, i'll come to directly to this magnetic levitation you know this is basically levitation uh, can be highly successful right now we use this uh, uh, you know high tc superconductors which are which are which works basically about uh, liquid nitrogen but just imagine that if we have room temperature uh, superconductor so we can uh, save a lot of energy actually uh, Uh, basically uh, mri machine can can get miniaturized your electrical motors can get miniaturized your power cables can will be more electrons particle accelerators like uh, you know light uh, light hydrogen colliders and all those things uh, synchrotrons all these things will become more and more efficient which uses a large electromagnet actually uh, people uh, are thinking that uh, there may be with this magnetism uh, you know ultimate magnetism there will be uh, star tram possibility of star tram there will be superconducting elevators uh, there is a lot of fantasy around that and uh, future of electron microscope there is lot of there are a lot of precise magnets uh basically electron beam you uh, align uh, using magnetic lenses so uh, which are not very far from perfect the problem that we see in today's microscopes is basically uh, because of imperfection in the magnetic lenses these days i'm teaching and that this topic i'm going to cover uh, on coming uh, monday at 11:30 on my zoom talk that how the magnetic lenses are imperfect just imagine that uh, with this superconducting magnets what will be the future of uh, microscopes i may not see it in my lifetime probably but all of you may see uh, you know young students may see in your lifetime so now question arises that we have so many materials uh, primarily we work on the oxides actually oxides have, have fascinated uh, people primarily iron oxide uh, oxide cobalt ferrite manganese zinc ferrite strontium ferrite these are all they are all oxides actually most of them are oxide manganese and uh, uh, you know cobaltrate uh, you put you can put rare earth all of these are oxides actually so why not why not uh, chalcogenides why not sulfide selenide there is there is uh, little less research on on uh, on chalcogenides so uh, we have worked a lot on oxides in our group a uh, lot on oxides actually less in chalcogenides my own phd thesis was actually on chalcogenides not in oxides then having worked uh, on oxides for such a long time uh, i i was naturally i was thinking that uh, we see uh, in fe3o4 uh, actually it shows uh, ferroelectric ordering at very low temperature so what what makes it special so naturally we were thinking that if we replace oxygen with uh, sulfide or selenide what will be the change then we started digging up some literature and uh, we found that uh, so this is for the student and i would like to you to read one famous paper by f jelinek in uh, that was published in 1988 i read uh, that paper in my uh, phd thesis and i still recommend all the students to read this paper if you want to understand this so uh, basically some of the mark some of the uh, reasons why uh, oxides and chalcogenides are, are so different one of the reason is basically the chalcogenide atoms are larger and also heavier than the oxygen atom fine and what is how does it change changes the life 
obviously it changes life basically the uh, crystal structure changes uh, when we uh, put these larger chalcogen atoms so the, the bond angle and uh, bond distances undergo a lot of changes so crystallographic changes are there the crystallographic changes are there and obviously uh, a lot of uh, you know this phonon frequencies uh, you know when you do the raman spectroscopy the, that will also change the bond vibrations are going to change uh, because of the mass actually second point is chalcogens uh, for example uh, sulfur selenium and tellurium they are less electronegative what we, we all know so that is the second part uh, oxygen is far more electronegative so that makes oxygen's electrical polarization will several times lower so you can't polarize uh, elect, uh, you know oxygen uh, in comparison to chalcogens but that has uh, a unique uh, uh, you know effect on its physical and chemical properties the third point is basically chalcogens chalcogens have weakened d orbitals uh, of excessive energy you know you have 3d for uh, in sulfur weakened 4d uh, in selenium and weakened 4d in tellurium but oxygen uh, doesn't have so that also changes a lot of physics uh, for these compounds actually this is this is basically just for the comparison uh, you know sometimes we forget uh, the size uh, you know how the size matters here and uh, electronegativity matters here so this basically trends explains that uh, ionic character is uh, is less actually uh, in chalcogenides uh, 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 I mean, they are more covalent. Like uh, when you uh, compare between oxides and chalcogenides, uh, it is for this reason that only. I mean, this is the reason that I mean, we say that why hydrogen, oxygen, you know, water can. Uh, why not? Uh, okay, oxygen can exhibit uh, hydrogen bonding. So you can see this table actually. Uh, this boiling point of H to M. You can M. You replace M with uh, oxygen here, which is water. and this is electronic configuration you can see amazing uh, results actually if you take h2s uh, okay hydrogen uh, sulfide uh, so boiling point is uh, quite low you can see almost minus 60 okay just changing oxygen to sulfur you can see a big drop in the boiling point from 100 degree centigrade to minus uh, 60 degree centigrade approximately right and selenium for, for selenium uh, you can see that it is uh, minus 41 and if you replace uh, you know for h2s se and, and for tellurium also uh, it's like that so there is some you know you can see the consequences of uh, these uh, simpler thing which we ignore actually okay normally we ignore this basic section so but they are uh, highly important so these differences in the atomic properties cause differences in the bonding of transition metals right when we now when we plug in uh transition metals 3d 4d whatever uh, to uh, for example iron or cobalt to sulfur or selenium tellurium relative to oxygen actually so metal to oxygen bond is quite different in uh, properties in comparison to metal to chalcogen bonds actually so as i mentioned uh, just now that metal chalcogen bonds are relatively more covalent in nature than metal to oxygen bond uh, due to the uh, obviously due to the, due to the uh, low electronegativity and second point is basically i'm going slow for the bend of student otherwise i would have ignored i mean this slide i should have passed actually because this these are supposed we are supposed to know but i'm going slow so that people can students can follow me and later on you can you can ask me questions so metal to chalcogen bonds always involve uh, you remember that uh, d orbital so d orbital takes uh, uh, into part and that also uh, you know basically we it is reflected in the uh, in the basically uh, physical properties so so uh, covalency for covalency basically there is a strong mixing of uh, you know s and p orbitals of the chalcogens uh, with the outer s and p orbitals of the metals so uh, and also um, there is another uh, uh, a very important thing which we should not miss is basically oxygen oxy oxidation state you know my students who are working especially uh, monica galawat probably she is in the audience today uh, i had invited her uh, so she also uh, found that a very interesting thing she gave a presentation at oxygen state uh, of oxides uh, so basically uh, we know that oxygen is usually in the oxygen state minus 2 but in contrast please note that a formal oxygen state of sulfur selenium is less negative you know it can minus 1 actually okay so uh, for simplicity we like to use sometimes s to uh, uh, minus 1 uh, 
okay so there is there is a lot of also there is a polymerization that takes place between you know there are dimers and other things in uh, in in, uh, in in sulfur selenium which so many things are so different uh, than uh, uh, oxides and probably this is the final thing which uh, i think this is uh, there is one more slide related slide uh, in this topic that energy gap energy gap usually it's not a complete uh, story it's not universal but uh, uh, energy gap in chalcogenides is uh, is basically less than oxides you can see from day to day experiences iron oxide is an exception is a semi metal and iron selenide you know fe3 is fe3 o4 is uh, is a semi metal and so is uh, fe3 se4 both are semi metal but if you look at other oxides they are ma mainly band gap is much larger and if you look at uh, chalcogenides basically uh, lead telluride and all those cadmium telluride all, there are a lot of in, uh, bismuth bismuth uh, chalcogenides they are all with the low band gap actually the energy gap is much less uh, so that is also uh, that also reflects uh, into their optical properties and many of these uh, chalcogenides are of, they find applications in uh, thermoelectric materials because of this uh, energy gap and uh, nowadays they are finding a lot of applications in uh, there are perovskite chalcogenides people used to work on halite perovskites now they have realized that uh, halite perovskites are not stable chalcogenide perovskites can be can be very uh, useful for energy applications right i mean we don't use for example for energy application we hardly use or we don't use oxide perovskites oxides are relatively stable but we don't use them The, so now the answer is clear in this uh, in this uh, slide so why do we so people are researching uh, uh, chalcogenide perovskites for uh, solar photovoltaic applications the groups which earlier uh, used to research uh, uh, halite perovskites okay so there is a lot of interest in uh, these chalcogenides i mean there are examples are uh, many there are many of these chalcogenides are layered compounds MOS2 is a, is an example molybdenum compounds like you know i mean in my phd i worked on layer com layer compounds i used to grow single crystals out of that they were all beautiful uh, you know cadmium iodide and uh, you know were derivatives of cadmium iodide to nickel arsenide uh, structures there are a lot of interesting uh, vacancies uh, cation vacancies a uh, lot of uh, uh, cation vacancy leads to so many rich uh, phase diagram so it is also a problem for uh, uh, synthesis people that uh, in comparison to oxide synthesis of uh, chalcogenides is quite challenging in the in the stoichiometric ratio uh, because uh, phase control is not easy phase diagram is very very rich you know that if you have this uh, uh, iron uh, x and uh, selenium y so x and y can range uh, over a, a you know long Uh, long uh, number, uh, very 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 number, and that makes the student's life so uh, so so di so different. But it also makes the life interesting because uh, you can you have much more tunability over the physical properties, right? And that's what I'm mentioning that metal vacancies are very rich in these chalcogenides in comparison to oxides, and uh, you can play with the metal vacancies, and you can you can uh, find uh, you can fine tune the uh, applications for a, i would like to mention one example that iron selenide uh, if you play with the uh, uh, metal iron vacancies you can in fact uh, vary the conductive properties like you can there are superconductors actually in this domain i mean there is one iron selenide is one of the iron selenide stoichiometry is famous superconductor actually so you can see the potential and this is also this is actually graph from my own phd thesis i i submitted in 2000 uh you know year 2000 almost 20 years back from exactly 20 years back few months here and there uh okay so you can see this beautiful uh, graph uh, which is schematic uh, uh, you know remember 800 megabyte i use 800 megabyte hard disk to uh, to all the same thing actually okay um so so you can see that these these empty circles are uh, actually vacancies uh, in alternate uh, layers so once you play with this uh, vacancy so these vacancies can also order they can remain disordered so they these things influence uh, properties uh, quite a lot actually quite significantly so that makes them highly diverse actually you can see there are superconductors there are you, you can make uh, photovoltaic devices out of that they have magnetic properties 
they show thermoelectric properties. There are topological insulators in this uh, uh, in these classes of materials. So that makes them very very interesting to uh, to to study actually. Uh, so iron selenide system. I would like to touch upon a little bit in the last uh, five ten minutes, uh, so that otherwise young students will be bored with this next part. Next part is for senior researcher, not for the undergraduate students. Okay, so. Uh, so hard magnets, or you can see that we we need in wind turbine. I'll go a little bit fast this application part. Um, so we we have this motor everywhere, and we uh, we basically convert uh, mechanical energy into the electrical energy. Same thing in the uh, hybrid cars. You have all over uh, magnets sitting there, and all come from China. They all come from China. China is basically controlling all those things. So magnetic. The reason, I mean, the fundamental physics. You can uh, look at uh, Kaliti's book. Uh, is basically lies in the uh, origin of magnetic crystalline anisotropy, which is very very interesting interplay. Uh, okay, between uh, uh, different spins uh, and their uh, okay. Uh, okay, now, now I will skip all this detail. Otherwise, I'll get trapped into this. Okay, uh, now how do we uh, characterize uh, uh, these uh, figure of merit for hard magnets? This is done by uh, you can see on y, uh, y scale energy product actually BH maximum and uh, axis, axis, axis is basically uh, years and you can see that people have been hunting for better materials with uh, better and better energy product BH maximum and now this uh, niodymium iron uh, and boron uh, sits somewhere at the top but there are other candidates as well. So. Uh, we had research uh, on iron selenide, as I said, that uh, we, we, we started replacing uh, iron side and that leads to, that led to a lot of beautiful research actually. Still, we are working, you know, this research is so fascinating that still, uh, still we are working actually, uh, one or two, two students are working in this area. It can, it can happen only when uh, this is interesting compound. I may not be able to uh, complete the uh, entire story because we are running out of time, but this is, uh, as I mentioned, iron selenide in contrast to iron oxide is so interesting because of its one number one is basically its large magnetic crystalline anisotropy. And without the presence of any noble metal or rare earth metal, second uh, point uh, to notice is that it is also potential candidate for cheaper, not that efficient, uh, but uh, you know, you can compromise efficiency over, over the cost, uh, uh, rare earth free hard magnet. And, very important for application that Curie temperature for this Fe3 SE4 is above the room temperature. So it is a it is also a potential candidate for other applications such as endocaloric refrigerant. And uh, there are some unusual unusual uh, electrical properties because it has got a very small band gap and uh, semi metal to insular transition around Curie temperature. So uh, so that makes it uh, uh, highly uh, unique. Uh, and this is basically this is the new this is the this is from Anderson's paper 1968. Uh, so uh, out of the spin uh, you know alignment uh, from neutron diffraction studies, you can see the spin direction. There is a definitely spin ordering. You can see the spin ordering here uh, below the Curie temperature. So what we did uh, synthesis was not very easy uh, initially. It took us it took us a lot of uh, still we are finding you know a lot of students in my group. They are still uh, researching. Synthetic, synthetic method, and we had uh, uh, Langmuir, uh, which came out very interesting. Langmuir, you must read actually. Just Google Monica Galavat and uh, Iron Selenide, you will find very interesting uh, uh, paper. Uh, if you want to learn the synthesis, that is the paper. That is one of the most beautiful paper in this uh, uh, in this science. Actually, uh, you can uh, Iron Sel Iron Chal chemistry. That is one of the one of the best paper I would, uh, we have come across. We have spent a lot of time on that perfecting. I'm not presenting uh, uh, the work of that uh, uh, paper because it's, uh, it's, it goes into the different dimension uh, and many students may lose interest uh, if I show you a lot of data, uh, but I'll just show you briefly. I, I'm not, I don't show usually uh, in this kind of public lectures, I avoid showing a lot of data because that is not the purpose. Just to excite the student is my purpose today, not to show a lot of data. But I'll, these are basically typical. I'm not going to detail, but I'll just show that these are basically what we get from magnetometer. The Y scale is basically magnetization. The units are EMU per gram. And X scale is temperature. You can see zero, uh, you know, very low temperature around 2 Kelvin we can go. And then around 325 Kelvin. 
So what you see is field pool. FC stands for field pool, and JFC stands for zero field pool data in front of you. And when we investigate repeatedly uh, these kind of uh, uh, curves, and also we investigate a series of magnetization loop, MH loop with various kind of uh, iron side doping. In this case, it is manganese. And then we look at look at this fat curve. Actually, you, you see this uh, MH curve, which is magnetization loop. So, so we try to keep on perfecting, re-perfecting. You know, that's what we do in the laboratory. We look at this uh, loop actually and its behavior. And uh, then uh, we look at the saturation, saturation magnetization behavior as a function of uh, iron site uh, doping. And we see where this peak comes actually at which doping uh, we get the better results. So all these, uh, you know, physics jargon, uh, you can skip and finally you can see this uh, red circle and that is the target. Uh, you can see the, this VH maximum, okay, what we need. Uh, okay, this is the number which we look for uh, better are magnets, okay. And this is the doping percentage. This is the sample iron three minus X, manganese X, SE4. So directly take your, I take your attention towards this material, cutting the jargon short. And you can see that it, it stands out. The BH maximum is quite high. And um, so, so what we found that uh, magnetization value increases a lot uh, without any uh, change in the query temperature. Remember that it, we don't want to compromise on the query temperature also. And we found 130% increase in the energy product uh, when we uh, dope mag uh, you know, manganese into it. But, but please hold on because there is a lot of interesting research happening by existing student in our laboratory in this direction. So we have a lot of interesting, tons of interesting data. And this is another way you can uh, uh, basically make this thing better by combining soft and hard magnets. So you can see the red curve is basically a soft magnet and hard curve is uh, also another blue curve is basically your hard magnet. So what is unique uh, is that why do we want to, we want to combine that soft magnet has got a smaller coercivity, but larger uh, saturation magnetization. And this blue curve, you can see larger coercivity, but you compromise on the saturation magnetization. And interface between these two things is not that easy, actually. So we, it took us a lot of time to perfect the interface. So interface, basically, uh, interfacial spin, you can see that uh, red is basically hard uh, spin, and uh, uh, blue is basically uh, your soft ferromagnet. And at the interface, a lot of the spring uh, magnets, this magnetic spin behave like a spring, you know, a spring in your ballpoint pen. So you can see this, uh, you know, this chirality in the spin, they, they start twisting. Uh, and that leads to very interesting uh, uh, class of material, which is called exchange spring uh, magnet. So you can make it in different ways. You can make uh, layer by layer. You can put these layers like, you know, soft over hard and then soft. You can make composites also, you can make core shell, but believe me, you know, interface, controlling interface is not that easy. So we tried our effort to make, again, a composite of oxide versus chalcogenides, and that is one of the cheapest and most, most accessible material. And we reached some success, uh, you know, some understanding we got uh, from this, okay? Last uh, two minutes uh, or five minutes, I will touch upon uh, this interesting hardcore physics, problem, physics question. Uh, which will excite all of you actually. And uh, this, this question, uh, I was asking uh, my students over a cup of coffee uh, that uh, in the cafeteria that, uh, oh, can uh, iron selenide be a room temperature multiferroic? What is a multiferroic? Multiferroic is basically you have uh, two or more ferroic ordering uh, uh, coexisting. So either they can be connected through magnetoelectric coupling or they can be disconnected. That is another point. But for example, Fe3O4 is a, is a ferry magnet uh, at room temperature, Fe3O4, okay? We start from oxide and then we uh, come to chalcogenides. Uh, so at uh, below Verbe transition, uh, Fe3O4 shows a ferroelectric ordering. So it, is, it was a first known multiferroic apart from chromium oxide, which is also uh, considered as a historical uh, multiferroic. So this was, so uh, we know that uh, why it was tempting to uh, ask this question, uh, this question was uh, very important to us because in contrast to uh, fe 304 uh, which, uh, which is basically a ferry magnet, a weak ferry magnet, uh, it, this iron uh, selenide is 
is fairly uh, it, it shows a very fairly large uh, coercivity, coercivity at room temperature so it is semi hard or you can say hard or semi hard uh, very you, uh, you know i mean whatever you, you name it uh, but it is definitely quite strong magnet so if if you can find ferroelectricity then you have a room temperature multiferroic we already know that this its uh, uh, curie temperature is uh, uh, above room, room uh, temperature so then we started uh, why did we ask this question as i mentioned that uh, fe3o4 is well known wavy transition uh, has well known wavy transition and below 38 kelvin uh, iron oxide is known to show uh, ferroelect switching uh, okay and uh, this is one demonstration you know uh, uh, how this uh, i mean uh, what we what we basically mean by ferroelectric uh, similar to superconductivity we have also defined two categories of uh, multiferroic type 1 and type 2 that basically depends upon whether uh, these two magnetism and ferroelectricity arise from independent mechanisms type 1 or they are interdependent type 2 so what we realize that iron selenide is a type 2 uh, type 2 multiferroic uh, because what we saw that ferroelectric curie temperature and magnetic curie temperature they are the same uh okay so uh, to to give you proof directly without going into the detail uh, this is basically this is a polarization loop ferroelectric polarization loop so y axis you find uh, this uh, polar uh, electric polarization and x axis you have this voltage you can see uh, that uh, it shows a significant amount of uh, 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 electrical polarization to cut the story short i will show you last uh, result which will excite you quite well and also it summarizes a uh, lot of things um just a moment uh, yeah yeah so this curve is this graph is unique actually you can see this summarizes entire story so top uh this gray shaded area is the uh, curie temperature and uh, uh x axis is basically temperature everywhere temperature scale is same when we compare here and the lowest curve with the with the, with the red line is uh, is uh, with red uh, dots is basically your magnetization and you can see magnetization shows a clear uh, transition uh, at this point okay around curie temperature and this is the real part of uh, permittivity the temperature dependent permittivity this also shows the transition uh, at around the same point and then we have plotted the uh, uh, you know specific heat capacity cp and this also uh, shows you a transition weak transition here and these are heat flow measurement it shows it also shows so that means there is there is a uh, this transition Uh, ferroelectric transition and magnetic transition they uh, they basically uh, coincide uh, at at a single point uh, so when we uh, summarize uh, entire story uh, so we can form a list of possible candidate uh, which are which may be uh, which may be showing uh, uh, room temperature multiferrosity then we find the top candidate is basically bismuth iron oxide there are very interesting papers from my my group also i think many people are aware of that uh and you have this lutetium iron oxide there are, there are iron doped uh, barium titanate and then you can see this, this another selenide actually here but most of them show uh, magnetic ordering as antiferro uh, magnetic ordering uh, okay uh but if you see this humble uh, uh, uh material where our lab has focused this basically shows a ferro magnetic ordering very strong ferro magnetic ordering and uh, uh, we we believe that uh, this is a very interesting discovery in our lab first time we, in our lab we discovered that it shows uh, ferroelectric ordering uh, uh, room temperature it, it is a ferroelectric so that is a very important part so what we learned today was uh, uh, how why should we uh, studying the magnet uh, magnetic magnetism as a carrier option what is so exciting uh, in magnetism uh okay so we see magnetism in nature quite a lot nature uses magnetism for so many uh, things many things are still uh, undiscovered physics of origin of magnetism still is a challenge you know we have not learned a lot about physics of magnetism it's not clear to us you know magnetic field magnetic force it's not understood 
uh, it's still it's a it's still a mystery many things are still a mystery people are still trying to find out application wise this area is super super rich and more applications are coming out as we speak actually a lot of interesting things are coming out and last part i uh, explained you here that uh, how the fundamental differences arises when uh, we replace oxygen with the uh, chalcogen atoms while keeping the cation say very interesting uh, physical and chemical uh, you know properties uh, you know you can see differences and then i gave you a, a, a specific example of a very very i mean age old 3000 old uh, material 3000 year old material iron oxide fe3o4 that is one of the uh, one of the easiest material you can think of actually that okay let me check this so we check first easiest material which is actually a very complicated material it's not easiest you know believe me fe3o4 is not simple uh, the experimental demonstration of uh, ferroelectricity uh, in fe3o4 was not uh, done recently only i think 2004 2005 still there are very interesting things people are still investigating this historical material and iron selenide is is not a new material uh, obviously not from the scale of lodestone but uh, fe3 se4 has been really research is several uh, decades old material but you can see that in in a very basic material we, we have not understood i would say i would conclude with my talk by saying that i do not know uh, much about uh, uh, fe3 se4 uh, there is yet to uh, discover many new things we hardly know anything about these Uh, very simple materials so i find it puzzling uh, if i start uh, you know going to the complex materials because i have not understood this basic basic material i have not understood actually so far with that i uh, conclude my uh, talk uh, and i think i took uh, slightly more time uh, but i think i i hope it worth it uh, uh, thank you very much uh, i end share uh, i stop sharing this yes yes sir thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and amazing lecture now sir we are moving towards the question and answer part now we have we are, we are taking first question from anirudh singh uh, good afternoon sir yes good afternoon uh, sir myself anirudh singh and my question is uh, something about materials so sir uh, as we all know that the beam of light coming from sun contains information about surrounding so is there a way to decode this information uh, by using some sort of uh, materialistic techniques can you repeat your first part of the question what i mean uh, i didn't understand what is the, what is the query in your mind can you repeat this uh, sir beam of light coming from sun contains information about the surrounding okay. so is there yes. a way so is there a way to decode this information by using some sort of materialistic techniques well what kind of material what kind of information can be there in the electromagnetic radiation of course see uh, the basic information lies in the polarization a lot of information lies in the axis of polarization whether it is depolarized or polarized of course frequency is there intensity all these things are there but a lot of information lies in the polarization actually and there are materials which where you can uh, and see uh, how the how the beam of light uh, undergo changes when it passes from one medium to other, another medium it is sensitive to the refractive index of the medium refractive index dielectric constant they are related, related so when the light comes from for example from sun which is a source of energy for all of us so uh, you know there are a lot of processes uh, in in sun a uh, lot of uh, transition atomic transitions are happening and light is getting emitted so uh, when it uh, when this uh, solar light uh, enters into our uh, environment so light get uh, depolarized quite a lot because of multiple scattering uh, so polarization of light is quite uh, uh, you know interesting uh, for physicists from uh, way back and you have all kinds of materials you know that uh, you can uh, study the uh, effect of refractive index and all kinds of things uh, how the light uh, interacts with matter and i find uh, it's amazing too uh, my favorite area is how the laser light uh, interacts with the matter uh, which i teach uh, in in my course work at ncl 
Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, now we move to towards the next question from Devarshi Vyas. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, my, I am uh, working uh, on a TMDC crystal um, on a NIC2 and COIC2. Sir, uh, can you please uh, explain that uh, uh, what is the applications uh, of uh, it, NIC2 and COIC2? NIC2 and, uh, and sorry, CO, cobalt, cobalt selenide. Yes. Yes, sir. COIC2. First thing you have to uh, find out whether uh, when you are making uh, NIC2 and COIC2, uh, whether you are making in the right stoichiometry. Because uh, what we learned, the stoichiometric control is not a joke. It is non-trivial. It is very serious for chalcogenides. So first thing you have to make sure that what you are making, what you desire to make, is what you got actually. Okay. Uh, application wise, uh, there is a phase diagram. I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure nickel selenide is not well researched actually. So you still, I think you should continue re researching uh, in that area, nickel selenide. We have yeah. been focused mostly on iron selenide because as I mentioned that we have not understood iron selenide. So uh, we, have, we have started moving towards other chalcogenides, but uh, not that fast. We are very slow in our, uh, we, we go slow actually. Yes, yes. But be careful about the stoichiometry. That's my message, actually, before you go to the properties. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Now we move towards the next question from Mukesh Chawda. Uh, good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, it, uh, from your presentation, I saw that uh, at MN 0.03%, uh, it is showing a higher magnetic field. Uh, the concentration of MN is very slow in Fe3, Se4. So what type of magnetic interaction is being proposed uh, in this study? Uh, because MN itself, I guess it is an antiferromagnetic. And uh, MN distribution in this Fe3, Se4 will be very far from each other, if it is evenly distributed. So then what type of magnetic interaction it is? And uh, whether there is a formation of Fe7, Se8 or not? in this case. Yeah, so MN is, we cannot say that MN is uh, antiferromagnetic. You know, that concept okay. is uh, wrong. See, MN, as you know, first, first let, let us understand uh, how manganese, uh, uh, you know, probably you're telling this from your experiences of oxide family, okay? So that is, uh, MN when, uh, basically you're talking about super exchange interaction. So when manganese, oxygen, manganese, when, uh, Super exchange uh, in, interaction of spins, manganese, magnetic, uh, magnetic spins through uh, via oxygen actually that leads to the uh, you know what you call it antiferromagnetic ordering, right? That's what you are mentioning. So here the uh, base lattice is basically nickel arsenide uh, lattice structure, okay? Where uh, I showed you the lattice structure. Primarily, you have this iron uh, uh, spins which are, uh, you know, there is an alternate layer where you have vacancies, part of the one fourth of the iron uh, uh, are missing. So this, uh, because of these vacancies, there is a large magnetocrystalline anisotropy. So when we don't want to disturb that uh, because it will be another compound, right? So we just wanted to play with slightly, slight addition of manganese or cobalt. So we found that in manganese slight addition, we do not know what is, uh, what is playing uh, a role in, in increase in, but definitely it is uh, affecting the uh, uh, magnetics, uh, you know, MS, MS is going up, right? So in BH maximum, there are two components, saturation magnetization and coercive uh, field. So uh, either you increase uh, saturation. So our primary aim was to increase the BH maximum. Got it? So uh, yes, if you increase MN too much, too much, then you might have gone to what you are talking about, anti-ferromagnetic uh, contribution. That's why we didn't want to overdope it actually. We just wanted to increase the saturation magnetization uh, by putting MN into that. And definitely we wanted to uh, see whether we can increase uh, K, which is uh, effective magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And we found that uh, there is a balance uh, uh, at sudden uh, doping concentration, concentration um, that's what we found actually. Obviously, uh, 
you can experiment with other dopants also and you can still there is a scope of improvement i i said i told you that we have uh, watch out for some interesting papers in the same material from our group we have much better results on undoped material actually we were trying not to dope actually i i personally do not like doping because doping leads to a lot of these uh, uh, you know interesting things uh, for example you know you need to run to the neutron diffraction to know where magnesium is going it's not an easy question and i believe that base material you can still improve actually by uh, you know you have to want us to focus on uh, the synthesis detail quite a lot that's what we learned actually yes sir thank you sir now we move towards the next question from dibiraj si chala good afternoon sir is good afternoon good afternoon sir yes good afternoon yes yes so my question is actually i am working on uh, coarse nano particles and uh, my system is a uh, cdo zno coarse nano particle so the thing is that uh, both of the materials one is, one is paramagnetic another one is diamagnetic and still i am getting my behavior of uh, i am getting saturation magnetization in mh loop so i was wondering if i can if you can help okay. me with that how does story actually the story is actually 18 year old story my personal story uh do you expect uh, uh, um, a magnetization loop in uh, 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 hopg you know uh, about hopg highly oriented paralytic graphite right it's okay. a bit basically graphite so i was uh, i wanted to use graphite as a diamagnetic uh, substrate as you are uh, mentioning your story that you found a yes. ferro uh, ferromagnetic loop probably mh loop uh, okay there is yes. significant uh, so uh, and i was scared actually i i i wanted to put my this uh, iron oxide nanoparticles uh, on top of the hopg because i thought that i will not get any it's basically uh, it won't have any uh, magnetic signature apart from diamagnetic background which i can easily uh, cancel out but i was shocked to see i was actually scared to see that uh, there was a, a faint uh, uh, you know magnetic ordering uh, uh ferro magnetic like ordering actually uh, okay there was yes. a magnetization yes yes so uh, so in your compound coming back to your compound uh, see there are a lot of ways you can have uh, ferro magnetic like uh, uh, you know even yeah. though, uh, your behavior uh, one thing you have to watch out uh, is the purity of your uh, uh, precursors whether they are highly pure because many times these magnetic impurities can come through the impure uh, uh, you know not relatively yeah. highly pure uh, uh, regions which you are using second thing is basically your gla glass vessel magnetic bead all kinds of things uh, for example if, if you are if you are using squid magnetometer uh, you have to be very careful because magnetism is an area where which can reveal all kinds of uh, uh, you know dirty chemistry if, if something is there because it's very sensitive magnetism is a very sensitive area it can reveal all kinds of impurities it it won't hide anything yes, yes. it won't hide even a small mistake you it will show up you know that right so that's why uh, you know magnetism i love actually as a first test actually sometimes that uh, it's highly sensitive to uh, so we can see ordering in your case can be another reason that you see magnetism also many times people have seen that all these nitrogen doping and all kinds of doping random not intentional unintentional doping can leads to interesting magnetic behavior there are a lot of papers on titania barium titanate a lot of papers are actually there what what you talking about but the thing is sir that my material is not doped the thing is that it is coarse and nano particles it's difficult to say you didn't dope it actually intentionally right yes That's it wasn't an intentional doping That's maybe I mean. there may be an impurity but in my okay. other characterizations i don't find any impurity as such i have taken many characterizations like raman then yes. xrd then other characterizations i have taken and i don't find any of the uh, oddity in that so that's why i i was wondering how does this mechanism arise because whenever i look for whenever, whenever i look for uh, ferromagnetism in coarse shell nanoparticles the studied materials are mostly iron oxide how do you see so the reason you used to uh, study magnetism i i cannot hear you properly. which machine are you using to study magnetism magnetism i used squid is uh, the data was taken yeah actually yeah. we didn't take the data we sent there yeah yeah that's why the truth is out actually so <laughs> so uh, what is your good name uh, 
Diviraj. 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 What you see is your material actually. So I can see the lot of some uh, un unintentional doping which you could not you see. Squid can do minute uh, amount of doping which uh, XRD can never never reveal. Raman can never show actually. Uh, forget about uh, uh, your EDAX. EDAX is a very poor uh, tool. Uh, when you look at the yes, yes, yes. So I can send you if you drop me one email. Uh, you can Google my email address. I can send you some interesting papers. Okay. Uh, sure, also, sir. Sure. And also, uh, we can later on have a, a Zoom meeting. I can I can spend time with you, uh, and I can help you with with the understanding. Thank you very much, long, sir. Long answer actually. So let us not hold on to other students who are waiting for the questions. Uh, okay. And I was also wondering why selenide is used so much in studying core shell and all because more than metal oxides, you see uh, compounds of selenide for studying core shell and no particles. Primarily because of uh, people actually, this is the problem. You know, sometimes there is a rat race. People do not know what they are doing while they are because some other uh, person is using, they start using it. So that was the reason that today I focus on uh, the basics of uh, chalcogenide uh, physics and chemistry that. Uh, when you start using uh, it, you're, you should have some original thought. It should not happen that somebody else is using and I will also use. So most of this race is because of uh, not a proper uh, uh, homework, actually. Okay, you see some paper in the literature and people jump towards that. So there is no, there is no uh, intelligent thought process. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but I see this frequently that I ask students, why are you using this material? They don't know. Okay, they saw some paper, got excited and they started using it. Yeah, uh, that's true. Right. And the uh, second part of this uh, uh, answer is uh, that comes from uh, excitement which was created in chalcogenides uh, by thermoelectric materials. Thermoelectric materials, uh, thermal electricity uh, has been, uh, you know, high ZT materials, uh, field of high ZT material have been contributed by primarily with, by uh, uh, chalcogenides actually. Okay. So, uh, third part, I would say that uh, these semiconductors, uh, semiconductors, quantum dots have created a lot of uh, uh, euphoria uh, uh, in chalcogenide compounds. You know, this cadmium, uh, you know, cadmium chalcogenides, cadmium selenides, selenides, because of uh, their, uh, you know, this uh, uh, bore excitant radius is is quite uh, significantly large that you can play with the band gap by playing the size. So that was the reason that uh, some of the chalcogenides, especially cadmium selenide, were so interesting because they're both more certain radius is, is yeah, it's, so it's a little bit large. And I have seen in some of the papers that band yeah. gap is yes. varied a lot. Yes, and also this uh, this layered uh, kind of material which are used in loop, as a lubricant, molybdenum sulfide layered, that also created a lot of excitement. So uh, some excitement is just uh, uh, just just without uh, uh, thought process, uh, and a lot of excitement is with thought process. There are both the side of that. That's true. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, now, if you permit, we can take one or two questions. Oh, yes, uh, I can. I'm I'm available. Sure, sure, sir. And now we have next question from. I have another meeting at twelve thirty, so no problem. Okay, sure. Uh, we take the next question. Last question from Krishna Kumar. Yes, Hello. I can't hear. Hello, can you ask? You can ask the question, Krishna Kumar. Hello. Okay, I think he's not audible. I think you can give opportunity to, to next yes. person. Yes, sir. Sir. One, there was one more question from the uh, chat box. Sir, uh, uh, someone is asking that uh, if, if you want to know the start from the basics of this nanomaterials and multiferroics, then which is the best book to start with? See, I have not used uh, any book uh, because when I started this area, there was no book available. Uh, in fact, there was no book available on even nanomaterials. So uh, I think researchers in my generation learn uh, from their own research 
uh, original research as well as some papers from the peer peer uh, you know process. Uh, so I do not know uh, uh, any book, but uh, you can uh, Google. You can look for some book by uh, Nicola Spalladin. You know she has written some books actually, and her papers are uh, review articles are as good as books actually. So Professor Nicola Nicola Spalladin, uh, she's a very uh, uh, famous uh, researcher. Uh, Professor R. Ramesh, he has written a lot of, Ramurthy Ramesh, he has written uh, a lot of interesting articles. So uh, watch out for three, four, uh, you know, uh, researchers who are giving direction to entire field. Some of them are uh, theoretical physicists, actually. I'm not aware of uh, any book, but uh, I'm sure you will find uh, something. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And we take the last question that in magnetic material, we have to consider their spin. So the spin have two, so the ions have two spin, high spin and lower spin. So what is the meaning of high spin and low spin? See, it's a, I would need a, a board to, uh, you know, answer this question. It's a class, you know, I need a board actually, okay? I wish I had a board and I could uh, tell you the low spin and high spin. So uh, in coordination chemistry, uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, applications of this uh, uh, changing the, you know, you can change uh, uh, from low spin to high spin as a, from, you know, there is energy gap, you can increase the temperature, you can play with the temperature, it leads to a lot of, uh, you know, interesting spin behavior, color change also. So it's a favorite topic of coordination chemistry, uh, low spin, high spin. But as a physics student in, cond in condensed matter physics, we do not read, uh, we, not, we do not learn this as a low spin, high spin actually. This is, this is the basically a chemistry language uh, which uh, which is taught in the inorganic chemistry. So uh, some of these questions require me to go into the board. So I can teach you separately. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. And last, I think some useful question somebody is asking that, sir, for a material scientist, which is the best three books which you suggest that he should have read? Uh, one book I would suggest uh, immediately uh, Arthur West. Uh, solid state chemistry by Arthur West, which I read in my PhD and I recommend uh, uh, students to uh, read because uh, the reason uh, is that uh, it gives you overview, it gives you kick start in the material science. It gives you kick start, uh, jump start in the material science. And uh, second, uh, second thing, uh, basically, uh, rereading your solid state physics has no escape. You know, any solid state physics. Uh, Reading it again and again uh, is, is always uh, enriching, actually. Third thing, which I, because sciences are fusing, so I strongly encourage uh, uh, earlier in my generation, uh, people didn't read inorganic chemistry, but I encourage physicists also to read uh, inorganic chemistry for like, for like previous questions, actually, which, okay. So uh, even physicists must uh, read inorganic chemistry. You know. These, these three things, solid state physics, inorganic chemistry, and a material science book, actually. So one book from solid state physics, any book, any book from solid state chemistry, materials chemistry, and third book is basically hardcore inorganic chemistry. That is good enough to jumpstart uh, you in synthesis uh, processes. Uh, and of course, uh, characterization has no end because finally you need to character, uh, you know, characterize, uh, but characterization techniques are there in uh, Anthony West's book. Uh, quite a lot, almost all uh, techniques are covered. And even in uh, solid state physics, that's the foundation. So you can understand any characterization if you understand solid state physics, physics is very clear. So, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for sir, answering all the questions from the participants. And I'm sure that everybody had uh, got their answers. And still, everybody, uh, so every, anyone have the questions? then they can surely contact sir after this lecture and from through email. Now, I'm, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Dr. Keval Gadani, sir, for the, uh, to present the vote of thanks for the today's session. Uh, Chintan, I'm audible? Yes, yes. you're audible. Uh, okay. uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Pankaj Kodar, sir, uh, for delivering very informative, interesting, and interactive talk on uh, potential material 
uh, this is chalko nights uh, dear friends uh, sir started his talk with some fundamentals and uh, future aspect techniques uh, in the field of experimental research sir talk about uh, metal charconite with uh, some example in details sir has also discussed uh, his research uh, reported research work with us so nicely uh, overall uh, i can say that this talk uh, powerful research package for students so i hope many students inspired and ready for towards research field uh, last but not least, uh, least i on the behalf of uh, organized committee uh, department of physics saurast university rajkot dst department of science and technology and good coast thank you so much sir thank you so much sir you, and uh, uh, pankaj poda sir uh, i can say that as a gujarati i can as a gujarati i can say that ke padharo gujarat ave sir padharo gujarat no i keep coming to gujarat actually all the time so yes i i am a frequent visitor to gujarat gandhinagar as in ahmedabad surat i almost every year in it surat so gujarat is basically the favorite destination of uh, all indians and any national destination is yeah definitely welcome sir thank you so much once again sir on behalf of all and uh, we welcome you and we thank you so much thank you so much for this wonderful amazing lecture we end this session we are and tomorrow at the same time we will meet on the same platform thank you all have a good day